We were locked in. You could measure those milliseconds. I guess I'm, I, I went to college. Um, I took that route uh, and went to North Texas and then to eventually the University of Miami because they, uh, it was just back then, only University of Miami and Berkeley College of Music uh, treated the electric bass as a uh, legitimate instrument. So I uh, um, uh, went to University of Miami. Eventually, uh, after a couple of years there, for some reason, right at the end of the semester, my phone rang, and there was this new Cuban artist, Paquito de Rivera, uh, who called me and asked me to move to New York to join his band. And, and I said, why? And he said, well, we're going to make a record for Columbia Records, and we're going to tour the world. And, and, uh, and uh, I thought that sounded good. So I left college and, uh, and went and played with Paquito. And we, he, we did everything he said. He was good going to do. We made a new album for CBS, which was my first major label recording, a live album in San Francisco. And then we went to Europe and had an incredible time. And there I met Dizzy Gillespie uh, at, at the Nice Jazz Festival. And we ended up um, becoming great friends at first. And he asked my phone number. And when I got back to New York, sure enough, there was a Dizzy Gillespie left a message and he wants you to join, join the band. So I I, uh, I, I went and joined the band and uh, went to rehearsal and there was Hank Jones there on piano and James Moody and all of these people. It was the most, I'm 22 or 23 years old at the time and, and freaking out. Um, and, uh, uh, but, and this is one thing I'll get back to education. Um, and, and yes, thank you for the, I had been involved in education, but I think one of the key things that I did was while I was playing with Dizzy, I still focused on college. And I was able to get my degree while I was playing with Dizzy Gillespie. And all that took was time management. I learned how to manage my time and negotiate and communicate well with people and found a way through University of Miami to finish my degree, never knowing I would want it or need it. I just wanted to finish it. And, uh, and these days, I mean, I would have never gotten the gig chairing the bass department at Berkeley had I not had that degree. So um, I guess my message in that is that beautiful things can happen, you know, getting to play with Dizzy Gillespie, but at the same time keeping my eye on commitments that I made, and one of which was to go to college and, and, and finish it, have all led to a, a, a really beautiful place, you know, three or four decades later, and having played a million gigs and a million different kinds of sessions and, and just the music industry is amazing. I mean, as you know, there's so many different facets to get involved in uh, and I'm the kind of guy that, that gets bored kind of easily. So I, I'm happy to have a lot of different stimulus, stimuli coming from a lot of different places, educationally, performance wise, um, now beautifully with Warwick in designing instruments and yeah, you know how it is. I mean, mix it up and have a lot of fun. Well, this bass is kind of a... The one thing that sold me on Warwick, uh, I, I had not signed with them when I came over here, but the attention to detail that Marcus... That's his path. That's the way he rolls. You know, he... he uh, and I was involved in a, in a, with a huge company before this and, and had a signature model. And, and I'd grown, I guess, I'd learned to accept the fact that great things take a long time. 
and, and that previous company of putting together, taking years to come up with a, with a great instrument. And in my mind, I guess, well, that's how, that's how it's done. And I came over here and met with Marcus and hung out with HP and, and all the other great folks in the factory. And I think by the time I left, three days later, there was already drawings and almost a working prototype. Within three weeks, we had a working prototype, and uh, it was that was one thing that sold me on Warwick. Is like these guys know how to get things done. You know, I mean, look you look around and you see the results of of, of that intensity and that drive. So for me, the base number one, I went on the tour of of the the uh, wood vault. I guess you would call it the. Uh, uh, all the amazing woods, and uh, Marcus held up one that was incredibly beautiful. He said, this is snake wood, and it's one of the most dense woods, even harder than ebony. And I'd seen it used in, in bass bows and violin bows. And I said, can we make a fingerboard out of that? And he said, hmm, sure. If you dream it, we can build it, right? And I saw the pieces of wood that were big enough. So that, for me, that that's the... Lee Sklar and I were just talking about it back there. The sustain on this instrument, no matter where you go, from a piece of wood, no matter where you go, this it's incredibly even. I kind of get chill bumps when, when, when I go to different, and I just know that that note's going to sing like this note, and this note, from the top of the bass to the bottom. So that despite I've never seen a, a, a snakewood fingerboard before to me that's innovative and, and I thank Marcus for that for, for bringing it uh, to fruition um, I play fretted and fretted bass but most people associate me with fretless probably because I play it in tune some of the time and uh, uh, but I, I love the, the spacing of this which I, I've had a Warwick streamer for 25 years and it had a bit wider spacing, and I needed something a little bit closer. Um, we brought in the, the uh, Seymour Duncan Baseline pickup configuration, of, and I worked with them on designing that about 20 years ago, along with the circuit. But one of my favorite features of this bass is this. The mute. The mute in the studio, particularly when I get my volume set exactly where I want, and I get my, my pickup selection, then I, I, I cannot think about that anymore. I've got the same level, and so when I put my bass down, I just mute it. Or when I want to tune with my headstock tuner, um, I just mute the instrument, and I don't have to uh, play with volumes. And uh, love that feature of it. Um, altogether, oh, yes, and the stainless, not chrome, but stainless. Being a, a biker guy from way back, I love stainless steel. And I uh, always had this, I love the look and feel of a pit guard. So we put this on, and, and when you play live and the spotlight hits it, you can like blind people in the audience. And I don't know if that's a good or bad feature. I may get sued for it someday, but it sure is a lot of fun. Just to mess with people that you know in the audience, and you get in a certain position, and you can like see them go, go like that. Um, but all in all, I mean, it's a lot of little subtle things, the, the radius of the fingerboard, of course, the spacing, the electronics, and, and you know how it's like a recipe. Like when you get just the ingredients just right, it, it, it creates the whole. It creates the, the entire being, and to me, that's what this bass is. It's just incredibly even, no matter where I am, it speaks clearly can speak loudly or softly, but it's very dynamic. Band with with uh, 
four bass players, two drummers, and a singer. And I, I, when I showed up with that amp, now, I, it's the first time that the sound man asked me to turn down on stage. It's literally, it, it is so clear and, and, and powerful. And as I'm standing beside Victor Wooten, who's not known for playing so softly, and, and I was killing him, man. It was great. He was like, oh. So for me, I'm not used to being asked to turn down. And, and that's how it made my life more complicated because now I was digging the tone of it so much and, and with the new cabs. Like my rig was uh, two-thirds as tall as theirs. They all had the double stacks. I was just killing them. I love that. Now I just uh, usually take the head with me um, just a production model, throw it in a bag, throw it in my suitcase, and take it anywhere. And, and what I love about it, two channels. Um, I'm able to use my fretted bass, my fretless bass, and have discrete EQ for each of those. Or I'm able to do play upright bass, which I love, or a triumph bass and a fretless bass. Um, love that part of it. Uh, but probably the portability of it combined with, with a real thousand watts it's just i know i can crush them if i have to hey man just being able to crush the whole victor wooten band with three other bass players that that, that it it made them all angry uh well, not angry but they, they got a little frustrated with me and and uh and they knew whenever i turned back around to just give another little turn that things were well i i have a term it's called the the millennial musician or millennium musician, or millennium bass player in this context. And that's somebody who understands a variety of styles, has a huge skill set of being able to read music if necessary, being able to improvise, being able to play rock with an intention, being able to, to play a variety of styles, whatever you're into. But the one thing that, that a lot of schools and, and a lot of people don't think about is technology. And these days, it is a viable revenue stream uh, to be able to, to record yourself with a, a master track or, or with a, just a stereo MP3 that somebody sends you to create a bass part and put it on there. So one of my big pushes in education is getting recording technology added into uh, curriculum, where, wherever it is. Because to me, it's, it's critical to be able to do that record budgets have shrunk over the years so it means we, we are going to do a lot of what we do on a laptop it means that that we're not always going to be in the thousand or two thousand dollar a day recording studio we need to get those skills together from that at least in my case of of uh eventually building my own studio and engineering myself and and learning about mastering and learning about video editing uh it helped me to realize that, that if i can learn it at a later age, if we can get it into the hands of, of young people, technology is easy. I mean, if I want, if I can't figure out something on an iPad, I give it to my 12-year-old, and she goes, "Oh, Dad, it's that easy." And uh, 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 and I'm, I want to see that in education. I want to see performance bass players, bass players who major in performance or whatever, emerge with enough technology skills that they can cope, because uh, truly. You do it, a lot of people do it. We record bass parts for other people and we do it at home. Uh, I've got a, I keep a uh, interface with me all the time. If I get an idea, I can just take out my laptop, plug it in, pull in some loops and, and, and literally record what may be the finished track on an album. Never in history have, have we been able to do that with that level of quality and precision. So um, technology, is mandatory, I think, for, for any young musician coming up. The other thing that I think gets overlooked, besides technology, is communication skills. Um, we, young bass players, older bass players, we need to learn better communication skills. And now that social media, you can say anything you want, and you can say it to the whole world, which is a beautiful thing, but it's also a dangerous thing. 
and and I do see some people getting themselves in trouble with their opinions which are subject to change and with their attitudes and feeling so freely about posting that on social media it comes back to hurt you when, when nowadays it used to be people would just look at your resume or they would listen to you play and hire you in a band or hire you at a college or hire you for a job uh, these days they do all of that and they go online and they google you and so careful about how you present yourself you know uh, I know as crazy as it is but good writing skills so that that when I produce something like fuss on the bus um, and I noticed this with you Andy you're a great writer you write, wrote your own book and 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 you know what went into that how much we have to learn to really write something the way we're used to reading it um, and and it, it's it's to me critical to be able to in writing present your ideas and present them clearly uh, it helps get endorsements when, when you can communicate clearly with a company uh, or with with your colleagues or the people in your band I think communication skills it's communication skills and scales are overlooked very cool thank you Steve that was dynamite man that's all we needed. That's no, no, no. The, the, the Ryan took an hour, man. I got to babble on about something. <laughs> Let's talk about something. All right. How about um, what? Did, what are you up to lately in some of your musical projects? What do you got going on? Ah, oh, man. Um, I've got a series going at, at Berkeley in my office, which is this. Somehow I got this killer office in the corner, looking out, and uh, uh, I set up a recording studio in there. It gets back to the technology. Um, I am ready on a dime to record anybody who walks in that office. So for the last three years, we've been, uh, I've been publishing and releasing a Christmas song, all done on bass. The first one featured uh, uh, John Patitucci, um, Eddie Gomez, myself, I think John Clayton. Last year's had Victor Wooten on it with Patitucci, but this year, I'm hitting it out of the park because usually I start thinking about Christmas in November and I get rushed, but I started thinking about it in the summertime. So everybody who's come in my office so far is going to be on that release. And that's ranging all the way from Dave Ellison, of course, to Victor Wooten, to Rocco Prestia. Lee Sklar is going to be on it. He's going to be at my office next week. But the whole premise has got to be recorded in my office. So it's like the office tapes. but. But it gets back to technology. If I didn't have the skills to do that, to, to capture great tone instantly uh, uh, onto tape, um, but that's something I'm, I'm excited about. So, you know, eventually, probably in two more years, we'll have enough to release a, an entirely bass Christmas album. A couple solo albums in the works that I'm about halfway through. One's a duo project that I've uh, just got duos with uh, people like Howard Levy and Mike Stern and Victor Wooten, some bass players, guitar players, um, uh, and just recorded some vocal bass duets. So that's what I'm up to. You had told me about something that you recently did with, you went to a string bass convention or something and ended up playing oh, yeah. the electric bass with those yeah. and they allowed that to happen? Yeah, that's, that's uh, yeah, the, the International Society of Basses, which is traditionally an upright double bass classical organization a few years ago let jazzers in and now people like uh, uh, John Clayton and John B. Williams and, and, the, and the great double bass players have become a part of that but I had this crazy they, they contacted me to be on one of their headline concerts uh, uh, one of the big night concerts and uh, I was thinking about what can I bring that's going to shake everybody up and, and besides I, doing a duet with one of my heroes, Rufus Reed, and another duet with John Clayton, um, I, I wanted to bring some classical music to the table. And I love Kusevitsky, who's also a bass player and composer, and he was the conductor of the Boston Symphony, actually, as well. Um, so one of our great new faculty at Berkeley, who is also, who she also, uh, I mean, she also plays with the, with the Boston Symphony quite a bit, beautiful arco player and uh so we did kusevitsky's chanson triste 
and she did the double bass part and I took the piano part and transcribed it for six string fretless bass. So I learned all the piano part on bass, the chords and, and all of that. And which was scary enough. I thought people were just going to jump up and run out. You know, Electro de Bass cannot play the accompaniment. But, uh, but she got to play it on Kusevitsky's original bass. His bass, the one that he wrote the piece on, he's been long dead, but his bass still lives. So she's playing the Kusevitsky bass, and I'm playing electric bass with it, which is sacrilegious by a lot of people's standards. It was a hit. I, I'll come out and say it. People that I would never have probably spoken with um, came up and, and said they enjoyed it and even talked to me about collaborating with them. So I may have busted open a new career as a, uh, a classical double-based accompaniment instrument. So, yeah, it'd be fun, like, you know... So that's one of these piano parts from the thing, and and it all works on a on a six string as long as you got a few artificial harmonics going on and and uh, something. But yeah, thanks for reminding me of that. Yeah, I thought that that was really cool. All right, now I'm done. All right, now we're done. <laughs> thanks, Steve. Thank mm -hmm. you.